So today, what we're going to be talking about is my SQL injection or SQL injection. Uh, we're going to identify the five most popular database engines just essentially in use on the internet right now. We're going to identify two ways that database engines can d differ. We're going to go over more than two, but I want you all to be able to at least identify two by the time this is done. We're going to identify what SQL injection is. We'll go over the attack. We'll get sort of an example going. You'll be able to take a look at it. And then I will point you towards resources where you can actually practice SQL injection. So if you want to get a cheat sheet and sit down and actually try to break into some stuff, there's some interesting places you can go and some applications you can install locally to experiment with it. That doesn't require you to just spin up a database. There are tools online for training for this stuff. I'm going to identify at least one tool, but we're actually going to go over more than one tool used in PHP to prevent SQL injection, as well as other programming languages. And then I'm going to identify an organization that teaches about SQL injection. Uh, however, we're going to segue for a moment because there's a handful of things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, first and foremost is for those of you who have attended some of my previous courses where we discuss like the dark web and some of the places you can go to buy narcotics and where they're buying child pornography online and things like that. Uh, another dark web web page was taken down and it was discovered that that for over a year was distributing child pornography and was owned by uh, the Australian police department. There was a police department in Australia that was running this thing and distributing child pornography for over a year. Uh, I definitely recommend for anybody who is interested in that class to sit down and look up the Australia scandal because this thing is probably going to grow. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of the web pages that are on the dark web right now, as I mentioned during my course, are run by law enforcement. And the things that they're doing, uh, I have a serious issue with. I disagree heavily with them distributing child pornography through those channels or any channel at all. However, that's sort of the, the route that they're taking right now. So definitely look into it, take a look at what's going on. And that should be raising questions amongst people. How are these web pages being seized and flipped so quickly? Something to keep in mind. Yes? Yeah, yeah I've just been doing that too they have. last year. Yeah, we talked about that in my, my other class. Uh, FBI does it. Uh, they were running Playpen, for those of you who don't follow that stuff. Playpen being one of the largest child pornography rings on the dark web. They were pushing that for a while, and then they finally closed that thing down and executed a handful of arrests. However, their methods in their arresting people, if that person did not flip immediately, uh, most of them are not going to actually end up in any trouble because of the methods that were used. That was a huge fiasco that I, we've already talked about it, but if you want to look at it, look at my previous video on that and then go Google about it because there's a whole bunch of information about what's going on with that. Um, in addition to that, let's talk about Equifax for a second. So pop quiz and anybody can raise their hand and answer this. If you are setting up a database, any kind of database that's going to be used for production data, can anybody tell me, true or false, should my username and password be admin admin? No, you're correct. I'm sorry, I don't have Mountain Dew to give you. This <laughs> I don't have a Mountain Dew to award you with, but you're absolutely correct. Anybody who answered no, guess what? You are qualified to be the CISO for Equifax, okay? Because that's what they were doing. They were running databases online with admin admin as the username and password. They uh, essentially, everything that we're taught from ground zero of learning any kind of cybersecurity skills, they ignored all of that stuff. Didn't pay attention to really any of it. So if that tells you anything, how much they care about your data and how much anybody else cares about your data, uh, this is a huge scandal. Most of us probably heard that it's 143 million people that were affected. 
they just redid the numbers. Now they're saying it's 145 million people and it's quickly closing towards 146 million. In other words, the number just keeps going up and up and up of the number of people affected. I'm gonna tell you right now, and this is just me making a guess, but probably every person in the United States has been affected by this thing, unless you are so young that they have literally no information about you. Because these are not opt-in companies. Your employer reports to these companies. Your housing reports to these companies. Your, uh, every time you go out to buy something, they report to these companies. Literally, every single place that you go and just about anything that you do reports to these companies in some way and they have some form of data on you, okay? Um, of interest is the fact that they're currently or we're going to begin the discussion of making these credit companies into an opt-in only situation where you actually have to go out and tell all three credit bureaus, I want you to have my information. In addition to that, they're gonna have to start re-looking at how social security numbers work. This is a huge deal. And they've kept it very, very low key and very, very quiet. But the fact of the matter is, is if just about every person's social security number is out there, date of birth, your employers, your housing, all your contact numbers, literally everything that you are as a person digitally is now out in somebody's hands. Okay? And that goes for all of us. And if you went to their webpage and actually like checked your data, that was a huge fiasco. And it was essentially like just a fake place where you can put in any numbers you want and it would just come back and be like, yeah, you're hacked. But it wasn't like an actual site that was checking anything. They just made the assumption that if you were smart enough to show up, they were just going to let you know, yeah, we got you. Sorry. And then that was it. Um, of note as well, for anybody who's interested in doing this, if you call your banks, if you call your credit card companies or anybody else and you mention this thing right now, they will most likely, or at least every single company that I've talked to so far, have some sort of spiel that they're going to give you. They're going to tell you we're going to protect your data. We're going to watch your stuff. Don't worry. We got your back. You know, zero fraud guarantee, blah, blah, blah. The amount of money that these companies are going to lose is going to be astronomical. Just as a, an aside, uh, it's going to be huge. So keep an eye on your stuff. Watch your finances. Um, keep an eye on what's going on in the news. But understand that these were the people that when they were told to make an update, hey, you guys need to update Apache Struts, they literally said, we gave it to our security guy, one guy. And they tried to blame it on this single individual. And then when that didn't really pan out the way that they thought it was, because somebody obviously got up and was like, you got one dude to handle this entire business. And they were like, oh, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, well, that fell through. And then in addition to that, they then said that one of the reasons why we're not telling anybody is because we don't want copycats, which then tells me that they haven't fixed anything yet. So they didn't want anybody to know because they hadn't fixed it, and they didn't want more people showing up and getting the data. So keep that in mind. That's where, that's where things are going. So... Many modern breaches involve databases. Go figure, right? <laughs> what do people want? They want your data. They want whatever information is in with, within those databases. Oh, and as an aside, just one more thing. If you didn't know that the vast majority of social security numbers are actually built on an algorithm, so if I know where you were born and I know your date of birth, I can actually run the numbers and create a list of numbers where potentially your social security number is within that list. So with enough information about you, and this goes back to my class on metadata, with enough information about you and then a, a social security number that I have, I can essentially verify that it's real without having to go to somebody else. So keep that in mind as well. Yep. So we regularly hear about leaks, vulnerable software, 
and companies who were not following best practices being hit by such a basic attack. And for those of you who are not familiar with SQL injection, it's actually really simple. It sounds like this really big deal, like you hear the words, oh, SQL injection, man, somebody's really sitting down and they're doing some major hacking here. It's not. We're going to go over it here in a minute. This is essentially breaking into web pages and companies 101. This is like where you start. So what kind of software is being written that includes SQL injection vulnerabilities? Who's doing this? Who's making this stuff? Well, I have a small list. And if you're on the web page and you're following along, feel free to click through these. But the first link that I want to send you all to is the SQLI Hall of Shame. This is a fantastic web page where this guy goes in and just breaks down SQL injection after SQL injection after SQL injection and really embarrasses these companies. Okay? It is a fantastic list broken down by dates that you can follow along and see all of these people who have been hit by this. But let's start with the big one. Who has essentially the lion's share of the web? Anybody know? Porn. WordPress, not porn. <laughs> but good, good guess. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> no, WordPress. WordPress powers a lot of the internet. A lot of web pages are powered by WordPress, okay? Well, guess what? Essentially, as should be in open source software, anybody can write software for WordPress. You can create plugins, you can make themes, you can do all of this stuff. And many of these plugins and themes become extremely popular. They get distributed all over the place. So our first Hall of Famer here is a popular WordPress plugin specifically for showing like stats and uh, it was installed on over 300,000 sites, and it was vulnerable to an SQL injection, a simple one. All you needed was access to the back end in the form of like a user account on the site, which for many WordPress sites, giving people a user account of some sort is very popular. Uh, and they have plugins for streamlining that. But, the, wait, so they have stats right here actually top 10 million web pages okay use WordPress here's our next one Illinois and their voter data registration so they had a database with all their voter information inside of it uh, Arizona got hit as well so if you want to look up the Arizona breach that was a this is a place where voter data got popped uh, Illinois got popped uh, and it's interesting because has anybody taken the time to read any of the emails that have been leaked, like through WikiLeaks? Have anybody actually sat down and started reading these emails, or do you guys just like osmosis through the web? Osmosis? Okay. If you were to sit down and read some of those, um, like the CIA leaks or the NSA leaks, where you actually read some of the code that they write, every single professional hacking group that is like upper echelon level, they write their code to make it look like somebody else did it. Okay? You don't break into a web page and then show everybody what country you're from because you're already providing metadata that lets them know where to narrow down their attack. If you get up and say, hey, everybody, I am 100%, I don't know, Honduran and I'm a Honduran hacker and all my tools are in Honduran language and when I break in I leave messages about Honduras and I do all of this stuff well guess what eventually somebody's gonna go and contact Honduran authorities and say hey we need logs we need to work with you hey here's some IP addresses these are trace elements that we have available to us we want to tra track this guy down so when you look at like the NSA code everything there is written in a specific way where they can actually go in and say I want this to look Russian or I want this to look Chinese, or I want it to look like anything. So when somebody gets up and tells me, well, Illinois got broken into and for sure it was the Russians. And we know it because the code said, like, I love Putin, right at the top. Like it was in all the comments. Uh-huh. And when I was like reading 
like I could just tell because the terminal smelled kind of like vodka. Like you see this stuff that they put when they're, when they're talking about these things, but you can't actually trust any of that, okay? When somebody says on the internet, you know, ASL, and somebody comes back and says, well, I'm a hacker, I'm 32 years old, and I live in Russia, and for sure, like, you can't trust any of it, right? AOL chat rooms, 101. So they decided to say, Illinois chapter in the Russian hacking saga. Somebody broke in to Illinois data, dumped it, they're automatically blaming it on the Russians. Okay. But let's not leave Joomla out. Joomla got popped too. They decided to uh, add a new uh, component to the front end, and it was vulnerable. So Joomla gets popped. And remember, all of these CMSs, content management systems, when you see something like this, like WordPress was popped, Joomla was popped, Moodle was popped, any of these CMSs, this isn't just like one person. It's not a single person. This is code that was distributed to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of web pages. So they are all potentially vulnerable. And how many people do you know create a web page and do an update and then don't come back for years? When I was talking about Google hacking, quote unquote, they also call it Google dorking. You take a vulnerability and you dump it into Google, and you hit search, and then it will just come back with site after site after site that's vulnerable to that, that code. Same thing here. These web pages will sit around on the internet vulnerable and be used as jump off points for years into the future. You can go online and there are groups of people who, uh, and a lot of these again, it all comes from MySQL injection, but you can go online and you can find signatures for groups. Free Syrian Army, Antifa, whoever your group of the month is, if they're, if they're going out and breaking into sites, they will often have a signature that will, they will include to show people how elite and what great hackers they are. So they'll copy and paste that signature and they'll dump it in so that it shows up on the front page. So you can go to these web pages, get the signature, go and dump it into Google, and then it will come back and show how many web pages that they broke into. Okay. So if you want to see the effects that this thing causes by them not defending these systems, you can go back and look at web pages that were broken into years and years ago that people just build, put up, and then never come back to. But here's something that's a little bit more real. So if anybody here is familiar with Airsoft, uh, it's like a, you buy these toy metal guns that look real and then you can shoot at each other and people dress up and they spend a ton of money on this stuff. Okay, but in addition to that, it's also a lot of children. So it's people with disposable income, it's parents, and it's kids. Well, 65,000 user accounts got hit off of the Airsoft GI's forum. So again, 65,000 users off of a single site. And not all of that data is valuable. It's not. I'm not making the claim that there's 65,000 real people that are attached to this site. Essentially what it is is 65,000 accounts were made and some of them are good and some of them are useful. But just considering who, again, your audience there is, kids, parents, disposable income, potentially not security orientated, maybe using the same username and password in multiple locations, it's a pretty good jumping off point to start with that data right there and then to start looking at other web pages to gather further information. Okay? This information alone is probably not worth a whole lot of money. But what it is worth is when you start finding people who are using the exact same password for their banking as they do for their kids account where they're posting about airsoft guns. And of course, user IDs, usernames, email accounts, IP addresses, passwords hashed. And then they broke it down by Gmail, Yahoo, Outlook, Hotmail accounts. Tons of stuff here. 
But it's not just little people, okay? Here's McAfee, a McAfee product that was distributed by Intel, sent out to tons of people, vulnerable. It's not just kids, it's not just small businesses, it's, it's everybody. I mean, we just talked about Equifax. It's a huge company, right? They make tons and tons of money with all of the data of trading and selling that they do. And they don't, they don't practice basic security. This one's pretty interesting because it was part of their admin console. Uh, and that's used for managing things like their, all the software that they send out, their antivirus. This is a pretty intense vulnerability here. The, the potential for damage is pretty high if somebody was able to get into something like this. And of course, it was available to the internet. One more comment. When you are setting up a server, particularly a database server or access to the database, limit as much as possible what is available to the internet. Okay? Um, I'm not exactly sure how McAfee designed this thing. However, your company should not be facing administration tools for your internal network and your systems out to the internet. At the very bare minimum, you should have something in between you and the raw internet. Whether it be a VPN, uh, something. I mean, just pick your favorite and run with it. But posting all of this stuff directly towards the internet, I have a, a huge problem with that. But the, the ride doesn't stop, okay? How about US election data? So we have a major, contentious, very important election. It's a big deal. And what do we immediately start finding out? That essentially every state in the union, plus the US Election Commission, have all been hit. Their databases dumped, information pulled from every single one of these groups and made available. And of course, it goes right back to Russian hackers. Somebody speaking in Russian is selling the data. So on my personal computer, both at home, plus my work computer, plus several other places, my computer can type in Japanese. That doesn't mean that I'm a Japanese hacker. It just so happens that occasionally I use Yahoo Japan to make purchases and I have to be able to make Japanese characters, okay? So just because somebody's typing in Russian does not automatically make them Russian. And being smart enough to go to a Russian web page to sell information, because who would be interested in US election data? Obviously foreign governments. Again, doesn't automatically make you Russian. I actually know a guy who speaks Russian. And he's just a dude I think out of like Kentucky or something. But he's very fluent in Russian. But it doesn't make him a Russian hacker. So now that we have that like anger and the, the, the sadness and the frustration and all of that just like really boiling to the top right now, now we're going to go ahead and push further in and we're just going to get ma just, just get madder because it only gets worse. So let's start with the servers. So just off of use, we have Oracle, MySQL or MariaDB, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, and IBM DB2. I'm going to tell everybody right now, MariaDB is my personal choice of database. I like MariaDB. If you can use Maria, great. If you can't, well, that's not good. Uh, Microsoft has finally started moving Microsoft SQL towards being able to run on Linux. They've got that big push of Microsoft loves Linux. And so you will be able to run your SQL server under a Linux box. All of these databases have subtle and very overt differences. Okay? 
They're not all the same. But what if, thinking about it, what if we are trying to execute an attack? What's probably the first thing that I want to do if I have my SQL injection on my mind? I want to identify the vulnerable server, right? I need to know what it is. Because if I don't know what that system is, potentially I'm going to be sending commands to it blind that it will never be able to interpret because I'm sending commands for a Microsoft SQL server to a Mariah DB system. And it's obviously it's not going to work. Now, there are certain places where between the two systems there's overlap, like a select. If we just do a plain select statement, it's pretty much the same no matter where we go. Okay, select, star, from, whatever, semicolon. We're done, right? However, syntax and the functions available identify two ways that database engines can differ. Again, syntax as well as the functions made available can all be different. In addition to that, we need to also think about licensing, okay? Your agreements, what are you agreeing to when you use these servers? That's also very important, whether you're honestly on either end, because you can usually make a pretty educated guess by the size of the company and what else that they're doing. If I look at a web page and at the end I see .asp, What are we thinking that they are? Windows. Microsoft. Windows. Microsoft Shop. So what am I going to take a wild guess and say that they're probably running as far as database? I heard SQL, Microsoft SQL. Absolutely. So just by looking at the web page, you can start making educated guesses. If I go to a, a FOSS web page, you know, Richard Stallman, and I go check out his web page, do you think that he's running Microsoft SQL? Probably not, right? It's running Emacs. <laughs> so when you sit down to actually begin just the very bare minimum of reconnaissance on the system, it starts with being able to identify who they are and what they're probably using. And it's entirely possible to run WordPress on a Microsoft SQL Server it's, it's possible to be running Joomla. I mean, people mix and match systems all the time. You see it all over the internet. Somebody's familiar with one set of tools and another set of tools, and they just force them together. But in general, what's the bad guy doing? He's looking for low-hanging fruit, right? You want fast. I need data. I need a way to make a profit. I need to do it as quickly as possible with the least amount of risk to me. And the more time that I spend fiddling around with your system trying to figure it out or to get into it, what am I doing? I'm leaving more and more information in logs. I'm leaving more and more information available for somebody to be able to figure out either A, that I'm there and I'm screwing around where I shouldn't be screwing around, or B, who I am. Hey, this person's in the system. Hey, this person's doing X, Y, and Z. Hey, let's leave them a way in. Uh, I think in one of my previous classes I talked about setting up honeypots and building a system specifically to get somebody to come in and screw around in the system so you can see what they're doing and where they're going, what kind of stuff that they're trying to run. You can do the same thing with a database. They have honeypots for databases. You have all kinds of different ways of getting somebody to come into the system so you can monitor and see what they're doing. But we're talking about these attacks, and we're talking about these systems, and we're talking about all of this information here, but the real question is, is what's the actual risk? So I set up a web page, and I set up a, a, a database, and I have some you know, SQL statements that are being run. What am I actually putting at risk? Well, number one is destruction of data. What do people love to do? Drop tables. The very first thing that a lot of people are going to try to do, particularly if that individual is motivated not by profit, 
but instead motivated, motivated by either ideology or by the sheer fun of it. So if there's somebody who's trying to make an attack on a web page and they just want to like, oh, I got to show my friends that I was able to get into this web page and knock it off the internet. What's the first thing they're going to do? Well, they'll try to drop tables. They'll try to spill information to the internet and then delete it all. Whatever that they can do to cause a scene. And for the vast majority of people, um, up until probably, I don't know, three to four years ago, I would say that was the threat that you were going to see. Somebody wanted to get in there and change everybody's name with Free Syrian Army. Somebody wanted to say, we are anonymous, we're legion, you know, expect us. They wanted something on that web page to show people how hardcore they were. But we're very quickly moving away from that. And we're moving towards this era of profit, of getting into a system and gaining access because we want to be able to make money off of that system. And they're much less likely today to just drop all tables because what's the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to pick up the phone and say, hey, the system's saying no rows. What does that mean? Right. What's the next one? Breach of privacy. Hey, Equifax. They should have took this class. We could have talked about privacy. People want access to your social. They want access to your address. They want access to all of your shopping information. What does Google do? They follow you around the internet. They sniff your heels everywhere you go. Every single one of these companies is interested in you. They're interested in your shopping habits. They're interested in literally everything that makes you as a person. And we've talked about some of the separation between your metadata and who you are as a person. If I have just enough metadata, I can break it down well enough that I can pretty much identify you for you. And I can definitely do it well enough that it would hold up in court. If I had to get up and I had enough metadata about you, I can pretty much show a jury who you are. And the way I want you to think about it is, so let's pretend everybody in here owns a car. Okay, so I know everybody owns a car. So that gives me every person in here. But how about a red car? Well, that's going to very quickly whew, shut the room down to a handful of people. And then if I know for a fact that those individuals, after they break into a web page, went out and bought seats for a 1997 red Corvette, and then I find out that there's one person in here with a 1997 red Corvette. I don't need to know who you are. I needed the metadata to be able to build a picture so that I can go to a jury and say, this individual right here owns a red Corvette. It's a 1997. They bought new seats. Here's a picture of the inside of the car. They bought these Sparco seats. Check it out. I'm sure this is my guy. And you can get up in front of a jury, and you can put all of that information together, and you can get somebody to say, yep, that's the person. And that's all it takes. Someone bought, you know, a red, uh, red sparkles, OK? Uh -huh. And then, I mean, how do you show that, that the person that did that is this person instead of that person? Oftentimes, it goes back to, are they? So actually, you know what? I'm going to give you a real example. I'll break it down by a real example. They had an individual who was on the news recently who was arrested for stalking young ladies on the internet. He was doing cyber stalking, OK? This guy religiously used Tor VPNs to hide his tracks, all right? So since he was using Tor and he was using VPNs, they weren't exactly sure who the guy was. However, he had communicated with these young ladies and given them enough information that they had a suspect. But they still didn't have enough data to go out and say, OK, yeah, this is the guy. So the first thing they did was they went to a VPN provider, because they had the IP address. And they said, hey, even though you're a no-log IP place, this guy is using your services. Can we get some logs? And they said, well, we're a no-log VPN, so you can most definitely have these logs. Here they are. And they gave up the logs. And so then 
they had IP addresses and they knew what web pages he, were, he was going to and they had further information. So that's all metadata that they can use for this guy. So using the car example, probably a bad idea because it, it seems loose, but with enough information, eventually you can track that person down, obviously. But even if you're using VPNs, even if you're using Tor, even if you're using all of these tools, it doesn't really matter. Again, it's going back to people are putting sites up on Tor, and within days, they're being popped by law enforcement and then flipped and then used as part of sting operations within days. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say somewhere there's a problem with the whole Tor hidden server piece. Because I, I have a hard time believing that every single person who's ever essentially set up one of these hidden services has been a 100% screw up. Like it just seems outside of the ordinary. Which it, in all honesty, it could be. It could be true. Every single person who's making these web pages and who's getting popped has absolutely no idea how to do it and they're just doing it and then ruining their lives. And they just did it for fun and I don't know. So it would be something though that I would want to look at. So with all of that information on the breach of privacy and everything else that's going on there, the next thing I want to do is talk about access control loss. What happens once somebody gets access to the database and gains enough information to gain access to more things, to go further in? Again, when we look at these databases and these breaches, sometimes we're looking at the data in terms of, well, the data is valuable because it has credit card numbers. But it's also valuable because it gives an individual the information necessary to be able to go out and execute an attack like a confidence attack. Hey, this is your credit card company. Blah, 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 I need more information about you. Oh, and by the way, the last four digits on your credit card is X. Your last four of your social is X. And they can provide you with enough information to make you feel comfortable. So that data becomes a piece that can be used elsewhere. Everybody heard that there was another quote unquote fappening? They leaked more sex pictures of celebrities? No? So they did it once and they called it the fappening. Uh, these individuals broke into like, well don't look it up on our network. <laughs> Wait till you get home, okay, guys? <laughs> but, so, let me take a step back here. Does anybody know who Paris Hilton is? Okay. What's Paris Hilton's dog's name? Nobody? What? Tinkerbell. Okay. And I know this because I'm a cybersecurity person. Watch, it's important. All right. <laughs> So, Paris Hilton has a dog named Tinkerbell. Paris Hilton took a lot of pictures of herself with her dog named Tinkerbell. Paris Hilton was in magazines with her dog Tinkerbell. And guess what? They put Tinkerbell's name in those magazines. So, an individual, an aspiring individual, got a hold of Paris Hilton's phone number and then contacted her phone company and switched her SIM card. And what was her security question? What is your dog's name? Tinkerbell. Oh, you know the security question. Fantastic, we'll just switch that SIM card for you. They then had access to all of her contacts. So they leaked her entire phone database. Every single celebrity that she knew, they had all of their information, home addresses, phone numbers, just an endless amount of data came from Paris Hilton's phone. She was patient zero, okay? From there, people then took that data and crafted emails that essentially said, hey, this is Apple, put in your Apple ID, I need your username and your password, and sent it out to people like Jennifer Lawrence, Emma Watson, and all of these other people that she was friends with. Snoop Dogg got hit, just a ton of people, okay? 
I mean, the, if you know a celebrity name, they're probably on this list. Well, guess what? They're celebrities. They're not cybersecurity experts. They clicked. They put in their usernames. They put in their passwords. And so this gentleman sat down and pulled down all of their iCloud stuff, messages, all of their contacts. So it continued to grow. Patient zero grows and grows and grows. They have photos. They have videos. They have everything. And guess what? They're people. They're people just like you and I. So what did they do? They took pictures of their junk. OK? And what did that guy do? He bottled it all up, turned, took all of his favorite images, and started posting them to the internet. And then he distributed a large, what amounted to a huge binary, to some other people and was like, hey, get all this shit posted, guys. Like, we got to get this out on the internet before they shut us down. He's going to prison, and the other two guys that helped him are also going to prison. Okay? They didn't get away with it. However, that's why now when you go to Google and you type in the fappening, you can find all of these images of all of these celebrities nude. Because it all started with Paris Hilton's phone being dumped many, many years ago, and that guy went to jail but he distributed that database of information. And guess what? It's metadata. And it's enough information out there for you to be able to identify these people and then to provide them with something that looks real or legitimate enough that you can then get more information. And it's a, it's a famous example of exactly what we want to avoid here. Okay? Because what happened to them could happen to any of us. Absolutely any person in this room could potentially have a situation where they have stuff on their phone that's private to them and important, but can be pulled by somebody who's doing exactly what they're doing. Okay? So access control loss. You could lose access to your server. You can lose access to your database. You can lose access to your phone. You can lose access to pretty much anything that you have that you care about once somebody gains access to the database. But what about avoiding it? Okay, so we have all these problems, and we have these issues, and we have all of this stuff that could potentially happen to you, but how do we stop it? Where does it begin? So, not last month, but the month before that, I did a little course, and it was called Introduction to Defensive Programming. How many people do you think showed up? Like six people? Yes. Those of us who work at the Chandler Police Department actually showed up for that because I had to teach it. But there was like six people who showed up to this thing, okay? And it sounds boring, right? Introduction to defensive programming, that sucks. Where's all the VPNs and the high-speed hacking and like the dudes who are breaking into uh, voting machines and stuff? Like that's cool. That's high speed. That's fast. Defensive programming, that sucks. Who wants to actually type like make and install and config and stuff? Well, guess what? It goes back to that. For you to stop my SQL injection, the only way to stop it is for you to stop it at the programming level. That's it. You as a software developer, you as a programmer, you as a DevOps guy, you as whatever it is that your job is, you need to be one of the voices of reason that stands up and looks at the code or looks at the system and says, this sucks, we need to fix this. This is bad. We have a problem. And of course, for some of us at our job, sometimes it is about keep your head down, don't say anything, and just ignore it until it goes away. For some people, they live and work in an environment like that. But if you don't, Maybe it's time to step up and try to, to do something about these issues. So we're going to start with the programming level. And then we're going to also go over some of the DevOps stuff here in a second. We have frameworks. Anybody in here, like a PHP developer, Ruby developer, Python, anything like that? Anybody? Yes? OK, me? OK. If nobody wants to raise their hand because you're in a police department, that's fine. Whatever. I'm just going to pretend like some of you are, OK? <laughs> Thank you. I got some extra hands. If you are a developer and a programmer, and you're working with this stuff, you have access to things like ORMs. You have database objects that you can work with. 
There are tons and tons of places, and maybe you've heard a term called a parameterized query. And if you haven't heard of that term, then it's time to like relook at every single project you've ever done. Because most of these frameworks now, they provide some sort of baked in tool to prevent MySQL injection. Even WordPress does. Okay? Believe it or not, even for as many issues as WordPress has, they have tools baked into their code that allow you to protect against MySQLi. It's there. Laravel, it's there. Falcon, it's there. You have the tools that you need. You just need to know that they're there. And for some of you, maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe some of you are sitting there and telling yourself, you know what, I use parameterized queries all the time. Great. But then there's got to be a reason why every single day we're still getting popped. Like why, if we all know to use it, why isn't anybody using it? So if you're following along, there's a cheat sheet available through OWASP. And OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. And I'm going to jump up here real quick and say number five is identify an organization that teaches about SQL injection. So OWASP is a pretty neat group. And we actually have an OWASP group here in Phoenix that you can go hang out with these guys, okay? So they exist, they're here local. Uh, I think they're about 45 minutes from here though. Like if you're here, you would have to head up north 45 minutes to get to them. So for some of us who live southernly, that's kind of rough. Uh, but they are out there and they do have cybersecurity related classes and information that's provided and things like that specifically for people who are dealing with web applications okay but you have access to a cheat sheet they are out here and you can learn from them in addition to that they have a really really cool project uh, that I actually have contributed to that allows you to practice things like um, SQL injection so the OWASP project has an actual, like, anybody here ever heard of Buggy Web App? Okay. So similar to Buggy Web App, OWASP has their own version of Buggy Web App. And it, what it does is it runs uh, Apache uh, Tomcat, like in Java, and it makes a little web server on your local machine, and then it gives you exercises. So you can sit there and you can learn about MySQL, or you, uh, you can learn about um, just a, a ton of different stuff. Okay, and in addition to that, they made changes to allow you to be able to run that thing on separate IP addresses as well as separate uh, ports, and that was where I came in to make that happen. So toot toot, that's my horn. But that's a great place to start. I actually have all of my students at Mesa install that thing and start using it. And during my Linux security course, I start them on going through that thing from beginning to end. It's a fantastic tool for teaching all of the different, very basic levels of cybersecurity and different attacks and techniques that are used. Uh, they get you involved in using um, like a proxy. So you can have like Charles, you can have Burp Suite. There's like different proxies. OWASP, of course, they have their own proxy for being able to, to deal with that stuff. So you can start with that as a project, install all of the tools, and then break it down so that you can learn each aspect. It's a great way to get started. But let's move back to parameterized queries, okay? Prepared statements. These are really important terms. If you're dealing with databases, you need to understand that you want to use prepared statements and you want parameterized queries. Those are the words that you're looking for. So if you are going to work on a project like Ruby or Python, C++, whatever, you're going to want to type in into Stack Overflow or whatever, MySQL, prepared statement, space, Ruby. And that's where you'll get started. So what is actually happening during a MySQL injection attack? Let's get started with this. Let's say that we have, for whatever reason, a select button, like a, uh, uh, a drop-down list of users on a web page. And you can pick that user and then hit submit. And 
you have that list of users and what it does is it creates a, an SQL query that says select everything from table of users where ID equals, let's say Aaron. My ID is Aaron, just for sake of keeping everything straight here. So what's going to happen? It's going to go to the database. It's going to use my ID name of Aaron, and it's going to select everything in my row and then return it for whatever work that it needs to do. Well, if I were to go in there and use something like Charles, and I were to run that SQL query and to send that post request, but instead of sending a user ID of Aaron, let's say that I change it to Aaron, semicolon, 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 or one equals one, semicolon, and hit enter. Well, guess what? Now the system is going to look for user ID of Aaron or anywhere where one equals one, which is true in an SQL server. Okay, So anywhere that it's true. So what we just told that system to do is to go in and grab every single user from the user table and dump it to wherever it's going to go. Okay, So if you're not handling that information correctly, guess where it actually goes? Yep, go straight to the page. And the person pulls it down, which obviously that's a bad idea, right? So what are people doing? They're going to web pages, and they're surfing around, and they're looking specifically for variables that they can change or manipulate and then submit in an attempt to make the database do something that it's not supposed to do. You want to give it either 1 equals 1, or you want to make any kind of other change to that information in order to get it to spit things out. Have you all ever seen a web page that uses jQuery to um, stop you from putting weird stuff in the inputs. Like you go to a phone number and you start to type in like letters and it just won't go in. And what they're using is JavaScript and most likely jQuery. And they're just keeping you from doing things. Okay? But it's all on the front end. You can turn all that off. And then at that point you can start putting stuff directly into the boxes. But again, that's why you move to using something like Charles or something similar. And the reason why you do that is because it's much faster. And remember, when you're first learning, and especially if you start using some of this OWASP stuff, a lot of it's going to consist of you putting things in by hand inside of a little input box and then hitting submit just to see what happens. That's, where the, that's the baby steps. But eventually it becomes an automated process where you start employing software specifically designed to start experimenting individually with each one of the variables that are available and continuously inputting different information in attempts to get something different. And it's all automated for you. Okay? The, the real pros, the quote unquote pros, they're not doing it by hand. They're not typing in semicolon, 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 one equals one, hit enter, wait. That's not how it works. Okay? These are just examples. But let's look at a prepared statement. And this is actually one right up here. So what we're doing is we are creating the SQL query. We're making an insert. And it actually looks better on the, like, if we go here, it's all in the code right there. So you can actually see it. But it's very, very hard to see, especially in the back. So if you're following along, it's much easier for you to see it. Uh, but the first thing that we're doing is we're making the SQL query and we're telling it these are the places where variables are going to go. Okay, We want to insert into this database and during this insert I'm going to give you a first name. I'm going to give you a last name and I'm going to give you a value uh, of email. Okay, So these are, the, these are the items you're getting from me. And then the next thing you're going to do is start binding the parameters. And you're going to say, hey, these are strings. These are, uh, these are whatever it is that you're, you're submitting to it, OK? Once you set your parameters and you execute this thing, then you can give it the actual variables and you send it on its way. It is extremely important that you know what's going into your database 
you know where it's supposed to go, and you have a very good idea of how big that stuff should be. Okay? Let's start with names. Do you think anybody's name should be two, three, four megabytes in size? Can you guys think of anybody who's got a name that large? No, right? Maybe, let's say that they are literally the prince of some country out in Europe, and their name is maybe 140 characters long, tops. So what are we going to do? We're going to choose maybe Varchar255, just for safety, if that. As you design and develop your database, so let me take a second here. Yes, if you are an application developer, guess what? You're probably also going to need to be a DBA. You need to understand how a database works. You need to understand what goes where. You need to understand, like, timestamps. Do you just save all your timestamps as varchars? Or do you go in there and actually set, like, a timestamp box? You have a lot of choices as you work on your database. And all of that is going to affect how you build this stuff. These prepared statements allow you to input information in a known manner. I can say, hey, give me your name, and no matter what they put inside that box, theoretically, even if they did one equals one, if they did a select statement in there, no matter what attempts at SQL injection that they put in there, at the end of the day, What's going to end up happening is the system is going to make an attempt to insert the actual text, that text alone, directly into the database. So sure, somebody's name is going to become Aaron, semicolon, where, or one equals one, select, so on and so forth. And it's going to have some kind of weird information in there as they attempt to manipulate the database. And it will try to just input that directly into that table. Which means we still need to protect the data by cleaning it. We need to make sure that it's safe. Okay? Uh, there's escaping input validation. We're going to get to all of that here in a second. We just talked about the jQuery stuff. Somebody can go in and they can say you can only put certain things in certain boxes. But guess what? At the end of the day, we can turn that off. We can still manipulate that. So the next aspect of that is, as the information comes in, we need to verify that it's safe. Is this information OK? Does it look relatively like it's supposed to? Should you allow a person to have a number in their name? What if they're prints? But instead of prints, they're the number 78. But can they put that number in there? Or are you going to expect them to spell it out? Sure, you can be the number 78, but it has to be all alpha, alpha characters. Got to start with an S. You have a lot of decisions to make as you develop your application to protect against this stuff that a lot of people simply don't do. They're not cleaning that date field to verify that it's a date. They're not checking to make sure that it's a well-formed telephone number. A lot of people are not checking whether or not your email address is safe. Uh, for a while, my bank, one of my banks that I work with, um, they were actually checking for very specific domain names. Like if you were Gmail, you were cool. But I run my own domain. So I have my own email server. I have my own domain. I have all of this stuff. So when I would type it in, it would be like, no, you can't do this. This isn't real. Well, yeah, it's real because I run it. But it, no, it's not Microsoft or Yahoo or Gmail or anything like that. And so they would get upset about that. But all you had to do was go in because the check was actually in jQuery. So I would right click and then I would take a look at inspect code and it would come up and then I could actually remove all of the stuff and then hit submit. Essentially, I was SQL injection, in, doing an SQL injection into my bank to get past like the thing that prevented me from using that email address. Yeah. So that I could get in. Because if they're not doing any kind of validation on the back end, which obviously they were not, then 
you can still get past that. And it's not hard. Literally, everybody's browser here, if you have a computer, you have the tools to execute these attacks. So the next one is stored procedures. And this one gets rough. And I kind of don't recommend this on account of the fact that if you ever change databases, it could potentially cause you problems. Because let's say that we're going from Microsoft SQL to MariahDB, your stored procedures are potentially going to be different. And so if your ORM doesn't handle that for you, then you're going to have to go through and make changes. And that's not good. Because that's where you start making mistakes or getting fast or getting rushed and having problems. And eventually you introduce issues into your code. Whitelisting. This is part of what you need to do. It is not what you need to do. Parameterized queries, OK? That's what you need to do. Whitelisting essentially means you can set certain table names, set in column names. There's certain information that you put into somewhere hard-coded into your code. And you say, if x doesn't match this, kill it. If you're having to use this, you can most likely refactor your code to remove it. Okay? There are changes that you can make in your code to make it where you don't need to whitelist things like tables or column names. It shouldn't be like that. You really shouldn't be letting your users make decisions on what table name or column name that they're interacting with. But for sake of completeness, we cover it. And then finally, escaping content. Anybody ever work with WordPress? Underscore ESC. Lots and lots of different ways of escaping uh, content under WordPress. Uh, depending on what ORM and what tools you're using, a whole bunch of them also have different ways of escaping. Any data that's coming out of your database needs to be escaped. Database, any of the information coming into the database oftentimes need to be escaped, but using parameterized queries, it's still safe, usually. But if you're going to allow people to write to the database, you want to escape any content that comes out of that database. Because you are potentially adding uh, <coughs> cross-site scripting as a vulnerability to your system. If I go in to your application and I type in JavaScript code and I submit that JavaScript code and it is saved to your database and later your database pulls that information and then presents it to the user, Oftentimes, that user's browser is going to run that JavaScript code. And it can be as benign. Whenever you work with the OWASP stuff, you do like a hello world. So you're going to take and create a little hello world JavaScript app, push it up to a database, go to another page where it's then served to you, and you'll be able to see hello world show up on your page. Now, obviously, you can use that to move further along. You can execute grander and bigger attacks once you can start running JavaScript on somebody's computer. There's a lot of ways of manipulating that. So we want to sort of whitelist our acceptable content. We don't really want to use anything like string concatenation if we can help it. And we want to make sure that anything going in or out of the system is escaped. We want to know what's going to be served up to the user. And we want to make sure that only our JavaScript is being served to the user. Uh, a really interesting one is ad jacking. So using JavaScript, you can actually post code to a web page where essentially you put a little film over top all of the ads. And then you gain the profit from somebody clicking on those ads because you're overwriting that person's ads. And then the person doesn't know that that's happening. I mean, essentially anything that you can do to manipulate the DOM, obviously you can do it with JavaScript. But if you're doing it to somebody else's web page, one of the methods that they use is that. Anybody ever play World of Warcraft? Everybody's heard of somebody getting their, their account stolen? You go to certain web pages, um, particularly World of Warcraft fan pages, and they use JavaScript to install some sort of key logger. And the next thing you know, you're trying to log into your account. And you can't do it anymore, and they've stolen your account and wiped out all your gold and taken all your items and so on and so forth. 
That's essentially the first step towards making somebody learn about two-factor. Give a kid a World of Warcraft account, let them go surf around on a World of Warcraft web page so their account gets jacked, and the next thing you know, they're asking for a, a UB key or a RSA key or installing an app on their phone for two-factor. That's like literally where it starts. The next thing is least privilege. Again, this is going back to DBA stuff and being a good database administrator, but we want to go with least privilege as much as possible. Everybody understands the concept of least privilege, right? We only want to give access to what you need and nothing more, okay? Do not let applications connect to your, your database from root. That is bad. Your application should never connect to your database from root. Nobody needs access to root. Everything that you build should be built in a manner in which that is not a necessity. Because what we're worried about is user rights, resource permissions, and privilege ele elevation mitigation. I don't want you to get into my database as root and then immediately be able to move around inside of that database to other applications. Many of us will run a single copy of MariaDB or another system and have a whole bunch of applications that feed off of that, right? Different databases and then tables within those databases. It's all hierarchical. So you don't want a single weak application to give somebody access to literally everything. In addition to that, you want to make sure that your resources are controlled. You know what makes me mad? When I'm reading and it says, the first time we knew that there was a problem was when server use spiked to 100% and sat there for six months. And we were like, dang, that's a lot of server use. <laughs> yeah, that, we, that should not happen, okay? You should be monitoring your logs. You should know what's going on. And barring you being brand new, and having only been at the job for a few days, you should also be able to understand very quickly just by looking at like HTOP, hey, what really goes on with this system? Oh, well, usually we sit at about 25% CPU usage, you know, RAM, we've got a caching server on there or something, so RAM is usually super full. Understand your hardware. Anybody ever been in the military? A couple of us, sure, cool. You ever like actually look at your rifle and you kind of know where all the parts are and what it's supposed to do and if you move the safety like it shouldn't just like spin in a circle like you have an idea of what your equipment should do how it should behave how it should look same thing with your server you should have an idea of what your server does on the weekends what does it do during the week if you see a spike in use why if your database is getting hammered, somebody should have picked up the phone and at least warned you. Hey, we're going to be doing a massive database dump or we're going to be doing X, Y, or Z. And if that behavior is outside of the norm, shut it down. Scream test. Pull the cable and when somebody comes up and says, hey, something's broke. We were doing X. Well, then why did you not tell me? It's hard for me to imagine. And maybe I'm spoiled. Because I can go to my DBA guy and I can be like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and this is what's going to go on, and stuff might be slow because I'm going to hit the Elasta stack, and blah, blah, blah. And then they go, okay. And we have communication. But a lot of places, I guess, don't. Because it's shocking to me that somebody wouldn't find out that there's a problem or wouldn't even know what's going on with their hardware until it's been sitting at 100% CPU usage for hours, days, weeks, or months. That's an issue. Like, that is a major issue. Again, whitelisting. If your application needs a single table, guess what? Make it a user, give it access to that single table, and nothing more. And then, in addition to that, your log guy can sit there and take a look and see every single time that user connects. And what does that user do? 
Oh, it makes a single select statement. And then if you look and you see that that user is trying to do a bunch of weird stuff, hey, we got a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Do not let your systems become a vector for intrusion to other systems. It's the bare minimum. Just don't, don't let it happen. Pay attention to what's going on with the computer. Let's talk about code review for a second. It's so going back to the programmer aspect. Review your code. Have somebody else look at the code. Have your dog look at the code. I don't care. But more than one set of eyes, if at all possible. Somebody needs to be able to check. In addition to that, you can do peer review. There's automated or tool-assisted reviews. There's pair programming. You can hang out with your friend, drink Kool-Aid, work at the same keyboard, whatever. It doesn't matter. But somebody else needs to look at whatever it is that you're doing. More eyes on code. Yes, for anybody who works in management, the first thing that's going to come to mind is these options increase time. I'm trading security for time. I can have more security, more eyes on code, more automated tools designed and developed to pay attention to what's going on, or I can go super, super fast and push stuff out the door and we can look like Equifax. Like that's, that's the sliding bar between the two pieces, okay? But, especially if you're a developer and you need to be able to go back and you need to be able to justify this with business parents, you know, hey, I want to add automated testing to my code deployment. I'm going to do continuous integration, but in addition to continuous integration, I want to run these two tool sets. So I'm going to kick this off on the server every single time we push to master. It's going to increase time spent deploying by X amount of time. Well, what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is, is we're going to reduce the amount of time spent by 12% on trying to fix code after it has already been deployed. Because we're looking for specific errors. You give hard numbers, metrics, and then you explain why you're doing it. This is what I'm doing, this is why, here's the hard numbers, and this is, and we're trying to make things better. And I can guarantee you anybody who hears that is going to have a hard time arguing. Anybody here do any kind of continuous integration? Build your software, make sure that it's automatically deployed, you have different levels, maybe a dev, testing, and then finally a, a deployment to master. There's a, so it doesn't look like everybody does and doesn't understand the concept, so I'm going to explain it real quick. So in software development, oftentimes we're using a tool called Git, right? And Git is a version control system, and Git is super cool. And if you don't use Git, please do use Git. Git, you can use it for everything. I use Git for all of my dot files. I use Git for every single project I work on. I write fan fiction and I use Git. Git can be used everywhere. Like I don't care what you do, you can use Git. Even if you're an artist, you can use Git. Git supports binaries. So you can push art directly into Git. And if you're running your own GitLab server, you can push images up into Git and you can have version control on your like binaries. So Git, super powerful, everybody should use it. Well, in addition to that, there's a thing called continuous integration. So as you push things to Git into a repository, like let's say dev, you can say every time I take new code and I put that code into this repository, I want certain actions to occur. And those actions could be tests, they could be um, linting, and linting is a term used for essentially you have a system automated that goes in, looks at the code format and style, and fixes things turn spaces into tabs, tabs into spaces, stuff like that if you need it. Um, what's that? I said you about started the war. Oh. <laughs> oh, don't get me started on Vim and Emacs, man. Uh, any of these items can also be integrated with your security tools. 
So let's talk about testing now. If you're writing software, generally you should also be writing tests for that software. We create a function. That function does one thing and one thing alone, and that function should expect very specific uh, input. So if I have a function called hello world, and hello world accepts a string, and that string is somebody's name, and then it should output hello world Aaron, or hello Bill, or hello Nate, or whatever, whatever name is supposed to come out of that thing, well guess what? Now I know what kind of input I should be expecting at any one time. It should be a string between 1 and 255 characters, maybe, because that's as big as we're going to allow to go into the database. So we're starting to look at this in terms of how big should variables be allowed to be? What should they look like? Am I going to allow somebody to say hello phone number and add a phone number in there? So I have choices. But let's say that I've already decided no. It's going to be a name. It's going to be alphanumeric characters, and it's going to be UTF-8, so you can't get super funky. So I can check for all that stuff, and I can set up a test that literally says this function from any of these names should be good to go, but any of this other stuff should fail. This is what a success looks like. This is what a failure looks like. And then every single time I write code, I can test that function and make sure that it is functional. Does it work? Does it work the way I expected? And what happens if I do weird stuff with it? If I start getting strange with my code, is it going to warn me? Well, same thing exists for stuff like your SQL queries. I can go in there and I can create a function with an SQL query in there, <clears throat> and I can test for SQL injection. Or I can use automated tools, and I can kick off automated tools as part of the job. So if I push to the testing server, I can run something like Nikto, InStealth, WebInspect, a whole bunch of different stuff. And I actually have a very good link in here that I'm very happy with. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but I try to archive.js uh, archive all my links so that they live. So no matter how late into the universe, you come back to this thing, hopefully it'll still be here. But one of these links will actually take you to a, a web page that explains in pretty good detail automated security testing. And what we're doing is, is we're making it a part of the process of software development. And now this is where this super chaps my ass, like a lot. Because when I talk to my students and I teach them, I teach them stuff that is considered DevOps, I teach them stuff that is considered programming. I teach them a well-rounded understanding of what they're doing. You got to be a DBA. You got to be a security person. You got to be a computer programmer. You got to be literally everything. You should be able to go in and do at least enough of everything that you can survive. Okay? You don't have to be a DBA certified person but you better know how a database works if you're going to be working with web applications. When you go to companies and try to get hired, the thing that I hear often is, well, we don't really know what you do. And it becomes an issue in terms of, so you're a programmer, but you're also a DBA, but you're also able to work on a server and you deployed an ElastiStack and so on and so forth, and you have all of this stuff that you've done, but we really don't know how that fits. Um, this, as you start getting into this stuff and you start adding your DevOps stuff on top of your programming, on top of everything else, if I could go back in time and talk to all of those students, this is what I would tell them. For every single set of skills that you've built, build a resume specifically for those set of skills. Okay, so for your computer programming stuff, build yourself a computer programming resume. For your server side stuff and your DevOps things, build a DevOps resume. And for each one of those set of skills and tools that you have, you can have some overlap, obviously. If you're a web developer, you need to be able to talk about your LAMP or your LIMP stack. But you need to break it up for each one, and you need to use the appropriate one. 
one of the things that I teach my students is uh, how to take binaries and back them back out into assembly and then to go through the assembly to look for like strings and code. And in my mind, when I look at that, that tells me that you understand how binaries work. It tells me that you understand how the code works. It tells me that you can look at a system and you have a pretty good idea of how the stack works, how memory works. It gives me, as a, a developer, an idea that you can do a whole bunch of stuff. And when I've sat down and talked to hiring managers and explained to them, I'm teaching my students X. And I'm teaching them this because it makes them more well-rounded. They have more skills. I've had more and more of them tell me, I literally have no idea what this stuff is. They wouldn't know what any of this is or how to use it or how it applies to their business. I just want a guy who can run Burp Suite. Like, I want a dude who can sit down and run Burp Suite and nothing else, and I don't care about any of that other stuff. And that's a problem that I'm trying to fix with all these people that I go out and I talk to. Uh, as an aside, Saturday I'll be speaking in Phoenix on privacy. What's that? Uh, no, I won't be at the code camp, sadly. I'll be at a different thing. Uh, for all of this stuff that I teach, like the SQL injection, if you understand SQL injection and you know how this works, that tells me that you have a basic grasp and understanding of how a database works. You know how information is being sent to the database. You know how it's being pulled back from the database. And you understand how databases and how information on a superficial level is stored within that database. Like I, I can pretty much guarantee that if you have a grasp of that one concept, I can go over a long list of other concepts that you would be able to deal with comfortably. A lot of people don't understand this. They don't know. They don't, they don't know how it works. Nothing. And I'm having to come to grips with that as an educator who's trying to put people into jobs and positions. Uh, one of my favorite tools is Nikto. It's pretty neat. It is a web server scanner, and it tries to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. It tries to figure out what kind of web server they're using, what kind of database they're using. It gives you a whole bunch of information. Uh, if you're a DevOps person, and you're trying to set up your system to keep people from being able to fingerprint your server, guess what? This is a great thing to put into the continuous integration rotation to make sure that any changes that are being pushed live are not going to start instantly revealing information about your system that you don't want out there. It's one more set of tools in the long list of different tools that you can be deploying that you can add to your rotation of stuff that you use. Uh, InStealth is in there. If you're on a Windows system or you're a Windows shop, Nikto has an alternative, alternative called Wikto, W-I-K-T-O, that runs under Windows. Um, I'm real big, and everybody who knows me or has been my students, what do I do? Command line. And the reason why I do command line is everything can be piped, and I can move information all over the place, and it's much easier to control that way. So everything that I do is Linux-based, command line-based. I like to keep it that way. So I'm going to go over the answers one more time. Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Post, Post -Risk SQL, uh, IBM DB2, popular databases. Okay. They're generally going to be the ones that you run into on a production server. If you run into a system out there in the wild, this is what's going to show up. Your query syntax and your stored functions or processes and the language choice are two ways they differ. I want to throw a third one out there in that also you're going to run into different, um, different agreements, user level agreements. So MySQL and MariaDB, they're supposed to be pretty much the same, right? But with the, the real big difference is going to be on what you agree to depending on which one that you're using. 
SQL injection is the result of running unvalidated SQL queries through an application by the use of exploits or with the help of poorly designed interfaces. Sounds super fancy, but really all it means is somebody put some characters they shouldn't have put into an input and hit submit. That's SQL injection in a nutshell. Somebody had an input, they put some crap in it, and they hit submit. That's all. So when you hear SQL injection out on the news, you see it on TV or anything, I want you to sit down and just really visualize that there was one guy who didn't use a parameterized query somewhere and screwed the whole thing up for everybody. Prepared statements or parameterized queries can help defend against SQL injection. That's your number one tool. When you make your SQL query and you're taking in user input, you need to make sure that you know what you're bringing in and you need to insert it into the database in a safe and correct manner. And that's it. Literally probably 10 seconds extra for you to look up what you need to be doing and then eventually you'll do it enough times that it becomes second nature and as you do your programming, you'll just do it. And then finally, OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. They have a lot of cool stuff that they do. They do it out here locally. They do different events all over the place. You can join them as far as groups go. And then of course, for those of you who are trying to shore up a resume, joining OWASP looks pretty good on the resume. It's one more thing that you can talk about and discuss when you go in to go get yourself a job. Okay? And you can put in that you use their cheat sheet. And also, for those of you who are looking for security related jobs, there is a thing called the OWASP Top 10. Google it. Those are essentially going to be the questions that they sit down and ask you during your interview. If you do a cybersecurity related interview and those people are hot and heavy for OWASP, they're going to ask you about the OWASP top 10. That is essentially the things that they're going to be looking for. Okay. Now breaches happen to the best prepared. I don't care who you are, what you do, potentially something bad is going to happen. Somebody will find a way in, somebody will screw up, you know, somebody's going to go out in the parking lot and find that super juicy, cool thumb drive that says hot pictures and bring it inside and stick it in a server and you're going to, it's going to be bad. Something's going to happen, okay? But it's not an excuse and it's not a blessing for you to screw off. You as a developer cannot ignore best practices just because the world sucks. Like, we still have to stand up and be good developers who do things. Develop your software in the most secure math method possible. Use all of the tools available to you. Continuous integration, all of these cybersecurity tools for scanning. There's an endless number of tools out there in the world designed specifically for trying to break into your stuff. Why aren't you using them? The bad guys are. Okay? There is a bad guy out there scanning your system right now. Anybody actually running a server? I got several. Anybody ever actually sit there and tail F their logs? And what's happening? Somebody's trying to break into your stuff over and over, all day, all night. They're, they're, they're going to make the attempt. Mitigate that threat. Try the tools yourself. Run your own stuff. Make sure that your system is safe. Do it on stuff that you own and that you're allowed to do it, okay? Don't go get yourself in trouble. But if you're going to run all of these servers and you're going to run all this stuff, search it. Check it. Make sure it's safe. Uh, I spent about six months running a honeypot just as an experiment. I had an SSH honeypot that was essentially the... I had set up the password as admin password 01 and I actually had to change the password to admin password because people were not breaking into it. Like I, <laughs> I, I was sitting there and coming back to it over and over and over hoping somebody had broken into this thing and I was like, I can't get them to do it. So I finally had to like change my username and password to the easiest way of getting in and then they popped me. And I got to see them come into this honeypot and try to run commands and do stuff and I would follow along with them. It actually set, you could sit there and you could connect to the honeypot and you can watch in real time as they would log in and they would move CD from directory to directory. They would LS. They would cat things. They were looking around trying to figure out what they were in and what they were doing. 
Now the problem with most of these honeypots are that there are fingerprints that a good hacker is going to look for. So if the first thing they do is come in and immediately try to dump all the users, and they start looking at all the users, and they notice that that user list is the same as literally all the other honeypots, well then they immediately bounce. So you're not going to catch the good guys, like the guys that know what they're doing. Those are not the ones that are going to be inside your honeypot playing around. But you're going to catch the, the script kitty bozos who jump in there and start just running stuff. And you can see what they're trying to connect to and what kind of URLs they're trying to hit and what they're trying to download and all that. So there's a ton of different ways that you can set yourself up for success to be able to monitor what's going on out in the world, OK? So what are my final recommendations? If this is the first time coming to this thing, I'm going to give you a surprise. The first one is use Linux. No. Yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> wow. Uh, I believe that everybody should be using Linux, especially if you're computer literate. If you are computer literate, you do not have an excuse for using Windows. Like, we've gotten to the, the land of Steam. Like, all my visual novel point and click games are available on Steam now. Like, all of that stuff is there, okay? Get off Windows, stop using Windows, and move over towards Linux. Like, get on the Linux train. Like, everybody needs to do that. Review your code. And we also need to foster a positive environment for improvement. If the code sucks, tell somebody. Raise your hand and be like, hey, this, this code, there's problems. Here are the problems. Everybody here can learn some tact. Like we don't have to hurt feelings, but we should definitely be in there helping each other. I review code at work all the time, and my coworker and I regularly tell each other when stuff is wrong. Okay? Don't take it as a personal affront. Work together to make things better, because remember, you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for your customers. You're doing it for the people who are entrusting you with their information, and you are the gatekeeper for that data. Take care of it. Because you don't know when that person is going to be the next Tinkerbell in Paris Hilton and somebody's going to be posting pictures of their dog on the internet, you know, naked, right. Their naked dog is going to be on the internet, okay? So don't let that happen. Set metrics. Let's perform testing. Set those metrics. I want to reduce calls for service by 12%. The way I'm going to do it is X. I want to reduce the amount of time spent refactoring code by three hours a month. How am I going to do it? Well, I could just quit. I could just be like, well, I'm not going to refactor code anymore. There, we met the metric. Or we can actually improve our code base. We need to pay attention to what's going on in the system, and we need to start fixing things, and we need to work together to do it. For those of you who work in software development jobs, going back and telling everybody, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if we could reduce the amount of time spent working on old stuff so we can make new cool stuff by, you know, 50%. Let's make 50% more cool stuff. And everybody goes, yeah, I want to make cool stuff. How are we going to do that? Well, guess what? We're going to sit down and we're going to discuss the problems that we have. We're going to fix some of these security issues and we're going to get this stuff into continuous integration. We're all going to sit down and we're going to write the continuous integration tests that are necessary to automate this entire process here. And then we're going to move forward towards new, more cool stuff. Encourage all team members to think security. Every single person here is a gatekeeper. You are your own keeper. Okay? Your system, that's you. Your server, that's you. Your phone, that's you. Your home, that's you. Okay? Do we have a homicide prevention team or a homicide investigation team? Guess what? We have a homicide investigation team. We don't have a homicide prevention team. There's nobody who goes around and goes, hey, we're going to st stop that. No. And bop them on the nose. It doesn't happen. Okay? Same thing with your server, your computers, all of your technology, every single thing you have, your internet of things, you know, that stupid ball that bounces around and is supposed to have like treats in it to scare the ferrets. That's potentially a way for somebody to get into your house. Okay? That's a jumping off point. 
So you need to be understanding and looking at that stuff. Anybody here scan their home network? Yeah. Yes? Good. If you're not, you need to be doing that. If you do not scan your home network for threats, somebody else is. But you want to be the person that's doing that. And then finally, just to reiterate, automated security reviews. Guess what? That, that scan that you do, that mass scan, and that, that report that you pop out that tells you how many devices are on your network, that can be automated. Turn it into a cron job. If you can do one thing tonight, turn something that you do by hand into some kind of automated process, cron job, bash script, whatever. Build yourself something and make that a part of your daily routine. Anybody here running like Splunk at home? Any kind of log running? Yeah, a few of us. Elastostack, Splunk, any of those things. Guess what? It helps your career, makes you better at those tools. And it's one more thing that you can add to your security repertoire where you're dumping that information somewhere so that you can come back to it later. Treat your home network the same way that you would treat your work network. And treat your work network the same way that you would treat your home network. With care, caution, love, and protect it. Okay? Now, down here at the bottom, we have a little glossary. And I have stuff like SQL, it means structured query language. MariahDB is an open source tool, and it fulfills the same functionality of MySQL. Use Mariah. Uh, and then CI is continuous integration, if you miss that. So we have about 10, 15 minutes before we close up. This is usually the point where I open up for questions. If anybody wants to ask me anything or if we can discuss anything, I'd be happy to do so. Yes. I think the one thing that can change um, how developers work in terms of their efficiency and ability to collaborate properly on fixing problems is change in management. I came out of consulting leadership and I've seen it in a lot of places where developers get penalized for having bugs. A bug is not a deep, it's not like an assembly line. You can't treat code like an assembly line. It is a part. And if you the minute you change that mindset and start treating people like they're artists and they should collaborate work together to produce the best product. You'll get a better result. Sure. So just to run off of that, one of my favorite stories about developers is the gentleman who worked at a place where they actually paid by line of code. So for every line of code that you wrote, you got additional money added to your paycheck. So they had applications that were monstrous, you know, tens of thousands of lines long, specifically for the fact that that was how you got paid. So finally, this guy finally just broke down and went in there and reduced this multi-hundred thousand line application down to something like a handful, maybe 100, 200 lines of code. And the whole point was, if the leadership and the people who are in charge do not treat the, the job as, as the way that it should be in terms of, hey, let's, let's make things small, let's make them compact, let's make them intelligent, and everything needs to be done correct, but if you encourage other metrics, people will exploit that. People will make mistakes that they hide. Uh, error logging suddenly disappears when errors become a problem. If you get penalized for every time an error shows up, well, guess what? All those errors are going to start heading to dev null. Because for every single thing that you try to, to uh, penalize or punish for, there is a workaround to it. You can make errors disappear. You can make code disappear. You can do any of those things. That's true. Yep. So, anything else? Have you ever read that, um, that web app, Penetration's Handbook, and notice it's like a big ass book by the dudes that, it's the web app, uh, web app Penetration's Handbook, it's just like for the, uh, hacker's handbook, but it goes through and lets you go through everything with OWASP and practice everything and explains like kind of very idiot proof. <laughs> okay. It's a pretty good book. No, I haven't, I haven't read that. I've, uh, so the question was posed whether or not I've read one of the OWASP books. Essentially what I do is I take the, the actual OWASP equivalent of Buggy web app. Uh, I set that up. And then I work people through that from beginning to end. Now, some of them are broken, some of the lessons. 
on it are broken and they'll actually say at the top this lesson does not work. So if you're trying to shore up a resume, if, if I may, recommend fix it. Find a way to make that thing work as a test or whatever it is and you can actually follow along. Uh, they have essentially a whole bunch of good examples and then a broken one and then a whole bunch that are not good. So start fixing them, submitting those into GitHub and getting your GitHub shored up. Uh, I have 27 projects I contribute to and I'm a major contributor I think on three or four including Hub. Uh, if you ever go on the Hub project and the guy who owns GitHub, there is a, an entire thread where I tried to explain to him how to use Git because I didn't know who he was. <laughs> that, that is part of my like historical record of, hey, this is me using Git and getting better at Git. And there's this point where I'm adding ARM support to Hub. Hub is a project for Git that allows you to run Git uh, commands directly from the command line and I was putting in ARM support so that it would run on like Raspberry Pis and things like that and as I put that in there he jumped in to kind of critique my code and let me know what I needed to change and stuff but he couldn't get something to work and so I tried to like break it down on how to like open a file in Vim and stuff for this guy and uh, a whole bunch of people got in there and were like lol laugh 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 and then I finally like looked the guy up and was like oh never mind <laughs> But um, it's a perfect opportunity to get started. If you don't have a whole bunch of stuff in your GitHub, start learning how to be a computer hacker and start contributing to projects. And guess what? All of that stuff can go on the resume. Anything else? No? Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Have a great night. Please enjoy.